Good evening. My name is Kelsey Olson, and I have the great pleasure of serving as Deputy Secretary for the Kansas Department of Agriculture. Welcome to the sixth annual Kansas Summit on Agricultural Growth. I appreciate you taking your time this evening to join us for the discussion about the corn sector as we grow together the agriculture industry in our state. Although this year's main Ag Growth Summit event will be held in person in Manhattan in August, we decided to host to once again host our sector breakout sessions online to allow for a wide participation from people across the state. After all, your involvement is key to the success of this event and key to the Kansas agriculture industry. The strength of the Kansas agriculture comes from your hard work, dedication, and leadership, all of which have made it the state's largest economic driver and strong industry. The purpose of this summit is, to strate is strategic industry growth, and that requires communication, coordination, and collaboration. Thank you again for taking your time out of today to be a part of this effort in the corn discussion. I'll now turn this webinar over to our leader, Russell Plaschka. Thank you, Deputy Secretary Olson, and welcome everybody to this evening's corn sector breakout. <clears throat> Um, as Secretary Olson said, my name is Russell Plaschko with the Ag Marketing Division here at KDA, and I'm glad that you've taken some time and chose to spend your evening with us for this next hour, maybe hour and a half, depending on how well our discussion goes after we hear from some great presenters on some great information about the corn industry. So really, the corn industry in the state of Kansas is one of the is a very vibrant industry. Its total direct output of over $3 billion creates over 7,600 jobs in the state, and those are through indirect and induced impacts. This industry supports a total of 16,640 jobs total and provides a total economic contribution of $5.4 billion. So in, in addition, the ethanol industry is a primary supporter of the corn industry in Kansas. That provides an additional 4,000 jobs as well as a total economic contribution of $2.2 billion from the ethanol industry. So a very important sector in Kansas agriculture. The vision of this agency is to provide an ideal environment for long-term sustainable agriculture prosperity and statewide economic growth. Our summit sector sessions provide the platform to entertain opportunities to talk about those barriers and also to provide a platform and a space where we can talk about growth in the overall agriculture industry. So a few housekeeping details before we really get into it. You know, everybody, we were just talking earlier about um, how we're all kind of Zoom professionals, though we may occasionally hit a road bump here and there. So even with that, we'd like to remind you that during the presentation, everybody will be muted. Uh, if you have a question at any time, please feel free and we encourage you to put that in the chat. We will be looking at the chat and we will get to those questions or comments as time allows. So when we get done with all the presentations, we'll unmute and hopefully you can speak up, unmute yourself and talk and discuss during this session. So with that, oh, one last thing before I forget, the session is being recorded and will be available online after the session's over on our website. So with that, I have the pleasure of introducing Greg Krisick. He is the CEO of Kansas Corn. And Greg is going to bring some welcomes and also introduce uh, maybe a couple of guests. So Greg, thank you for taking time. You bet, Russell, and good evening um, to you and um, Deputy Secretary Olson and everyone that's joining us. Appreciate uh, being able to spend a little time talking about uh, um, what's near and dear to our hearts. Uh, the, the corn uh, and corn grown in Kansas. Um, it's been kind of an exciting, I'd say 10 to 15 years as we've seen, um, you know, for acres go up and we're down a little bit this year compared to last year, but acres go up and especially dryland acres um, with the uh, technology and the traits that are available in our um, uh, corn varieties today. And that's allowed us to continue to expand and, and uh, supply our main customers. Uh, obviously a long-standing relationship with livestock owners and producers in Kansas, um, certainly beef, dairy, which is growing ever uh, quickly in Kansas, um, pork producers, uh, and, and some and supply to the poultry uh, sector, uh, primarily from the southeast portion of the state. We get about um, uh, 27, 
to 30% um, is uh, of the corn grown uh, for grain in, in the state is supplying those uh, protein sectors. Uh, and then another 30% or so is going directly to the ethanol industry, where of course uh, we've been very supportive of uh, growing that market. Um, and we can talk about that if we have an opportunity later. Um, distillers grains then becomes an important protein source of feed from the ethanol plants as well. And then as we've grown our production in that 15 year period to where um, we're consistently over 700 million bushels and sometime pushing 800 million bushels, um, we uh, uh, see uh, corn exported, not only exported from the state, to other parts of the uh, panhandle of uh, Oklahoma and Texas for cattle feeding especially, um, but more and more to, um, uh, to, uh, to Mexico. Uh, and in some cases, we work uh, on exports around the world with uh, our uh, um, partners, such as the U.S. Grains Council and the U.S. Meat Export Federation. Um, I'd like to introduce first uh, Kent Moore, um, who is our uh, current Kansas Corn Commission Chair uh, from Iuka, Kansas, and glad that Kent could join us this evening. Kent? Yeah, thank you, Greg. I uh, do appreciate the opportunity to be uh, with everyone this evening as we discuss some corn related and, and directed topics. A uh, little bit about my farm. Uh, we're in the northwest part of Pratt County. Um, I'm primarily an irrigated uh, producer, uh, corn and soybeans, and, and uh, but also have some non-irrigated corn. Um, I think you know, right now the Kansas corn crop condition is in pretty good shape. Um, the uh, there's pockets that have some trouble, um, like always, but I think overall the state's looking at a, a pretty good corn crop right now. I mean, it's definitely going to have some. Looks like we're going to have some stress um, coming up, maybe here later this week and next week. But uh, a lot of the state um, has received some pretty pretty timely precipitation um, over the last couple of weeks. I, Unfortunately, that didn't occur here on my farm. I was about, uh, uh, the other day, I was about six miles too far east. If I'd have been uh, about six miles west, would have picked up a really, really good and beneficial rain from my non-irrigated acres and, and the irrigated too. I mean, it's always great to get, to get, uh, to get a rain on those irrigated acres. Um, <clears throat> so what's going on on my farm today? Um, which, you know, irrigated wise, uh, most of that crop right now is through pollination. It's either, uh, so that ear is developing, it's either got a blister and some of the, some of it is starting to have a little bit of, of milk. So uh, we're definitely in a, in a critical time for, for crop development. So we're critical time for irrigation needs and, and hopefully, um, you know, people that are dependent on, uh, uh, don't have that ability, received a decent rain here sometime in the last week to 10 days and, and have some, um, uh, some moisture to, to make it through the next, uh, next few weeks of crop development. Um, you know, one of the things that we have done on the irrigated acres here just in the last few weeks is we made our last fertilizer application. You know, on an irrigated situation, we do that uh, through fertigation, through the pivot. So we always kind of wait, make that last application right after pollination is over. And, and the other thing that that does and demonstrates that we're not, <clears throat> we're not putting all, all nutrients on at one time. It's spread out over the whole growing season uh, from pre-plant to planting, early development, um, you know, side dress, uh, fertigation, clear out throughout the season. We're trying to be good stewards and putting on on uh, that that crop nutrition uh, at at a spread out over the crop season, so that uh, we hopefully receive the best benefit from for making that from that making that application. Uh, fungicide applications will start uh, pretty hot and heavy in this neck of the woods, probably at the end of this week and next week. Um, I would say, uh, by and large, um, plant health, at least on my farm, is is better. Than it's been over the last few years. Uh, one thing that we've that we've kind of struggled with the last few years is uh, a bacterial leaf streak. So it's a bacterial uh, issue on on corn leaves that you really don't have an answer for. Uh, it's not a treatable situation, but for, for whatever reason, maybe 
maybe that bacteria didn't like that really, really, really cold weather we had in February. I don't have any idea, but the uh, but the bottom line is uh, we're not seeing near the uh, bacterial leaf streak issues this year as compared to the last two or three years. Uh, that and uh, the gray leaf spot issues, uh, at least so far this year, are relatively it's there, but it's not uh, it's not real prevalent yet. It's kind of you know, gray leaf spot kind of works its way up the plant, and we're starting to see some see some of those lesions um, uh, getting closer to that ear leaf. And when you see that, is usually when it means, yeah, we're going to go ahead and make that fungicide application to to slow that down. So that'll be coming up here real soon. Uh, like I said, either the end of this week and, and a lot for sure next week. Uh, one of the things that I've done here on this farm uh, the last couple of days um, uh, had a uh, pri a uh, pumping plant efficiency test done on um, quite a few irrigation wells. And basically that's just an opportunity uh, for uh, irrigated farmers to, um, basically I had an irrigation engineer out here on a farm and we went through the process of, of evaluating efficiency on center pivots. And, uh, and you always learn something. And um, sometimes, um, uh, sometimes you learn that they're working just fine, and sometimes you learn that just a little bitty tweak here or there can make a huge difference on um, on the on your pumping plant efficiency. And and um, uh, you know, I think a lot of that is becoming more and more prevalent. Uh, you know, diving into those types of issues to 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 ensure that um, those irrigation systems whether it be the, the well, the motor, uh, the sprinkler package, all of that's working together to work efficiently as possible. And uh, if you can do that, that means you're just increasing uh, the efficiency of application. You're gonna be a better manager of that, of that resource. So, so that's, uh, that filled a large part of the last two days for me was just going around with that uh, with that irrigation engineer and, and doing that process and, and learning. And uh, uh, we'll continue to do that well into the future um, just so we get better at doing what we're doing, which is basically what everybody tries to do, whether you're growing a crop or some other industry is just try to be as efficient and as, and, uh, as prepared as possible for, for whatever whatever your end product is. As Greg said, I mean, I'm involved in Kansas corn. Um, the uh, commission side, for sure, and the growers also, but the commission, uh, yeah, I chair the commission as all you got, everybody basically knows on here, the commission's in charge of, of that uh, penny ch uh, check off at the first point of sale and, and um, you know, with the expanded acreage and the and the yields that we've been seeing here over the last few years, really given the commission the opportunity to to direct some substantial funds uh, towards numerous things that Josh and Greg will for sure talk about further as we go on. But um, you know, the thing the thing I think that uh, uh, you know, obviously, Kansas Corn Commission has put a lot of effort effort and uh, emphasis on infrastructure uh, through uh, pump programs to try to to give that uh, fuel consumer more choice when they're at that pump and 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 uh, you know have the capacity to push a button and and get more than just e10 and uh, you know any place where that any place where we see those types of uh, pumps and opportunities present themselves to the consumer they always the consumer always is driven by by uh, price and um, and and you know what works, and I think we've demonstrated over and over and over that uh, that ethanol and and uh, and that blend into the gasoline supply works and works well for for all involved. Now, you know, obviously, where the ethanol industry is under constant pressure, um, and again today we're under constant pressure because uh, I just read before this deal that the Senate. And there was a bill introduced into the Senate uh, today, I guess, that um, would eliminate the corn ethanol man uh, blend mandate in the RFS. So, you know, it's always stuff like that. And then on the flip side of that, I think a few days ago, uh, there was another, some legislation sponsored um, and presented that uh, would enhance the opportunity to have E15 sales year round. 
So it's always a constant tug of war, uh, both sides of, of uh, bad ethanol, good ethanol. Uh, it just it just doesn't end. And um, uh, so, you know, our I know our Kansas corn staff, I know the NCGA staff uh, are always uh, have their have their ear to the ground and and are always working on those issues because it it just never, like I said, it just never seems to stop. And uh, I guess it isn't going to. But, um, uh, you know, the other thing that I think the commission has put a great deal of effort into and, and seen a tremendous response was um, a few years ago, we recognized the, the need to um, uh, stress education uh, about, the, about corn and agriculture in general to Kansas students. And we um, tabbed Sharon Thielen uh, to spearhead that effort for Kansas corn and, and she and the, her team have done, done a phenomenal job of reaching of reaching students and uh, Kansas corn has been proud to sponsor uh, you know all of the equipment needs and all the lesson needs and all the all the planning needs and all the training needs of, uh, of having that um, education presented to our students and I think uh, it's been a tremendous success we've it's grown way way faster and bigger than we would have ever envisioned when we started it so I think that that just demonstrates that uh, a huge demand out there from I think from the education sector that says yeah wow these people are are serious about providing um, uh, the supplies the training and delivery of that message to our students and if they're if they're willing to do that, we're willing to uh, to help them do that. And that's been a fantastic deal. Um, <clears throat> obviously, the Corn Commission uh, supports research, whether it be at K-State, KU, Pitt State, Fort Hayes, you name it. Uh, we see a lot of different uh, proposals every year and fund uh, uh, things that we think will be a benefit to, to uh, Kansas corn and Kansas corn growers over time. And uh, so we always do that, we always have that in, in, uh, in the works. Uh, obviously, we've put a lot of effort uh, since, uh, uh, since the Kansas Water Office started the water technology farms. We've been involved in that uh, from, from basically from day one uh, of being a, a contributor and supporter of, of, that, of those water technology farms and um, been to numerous field days um, for those farms myself. And, and again, it's just a, an opportunity to, to demonstrate uh, good stewardship and how can, how can we do things better and be better at, uh, at conserving and, and, uh, and utilizing our resources uh, as smartly as we can. And I think we've def definitely made inroads into that. The, um, you know, I know that that Greg and Josh will sh share a lot more of the of the dirty details about some of these things, and um, uh, would I would absolutely express my appreciation to to uh, Greg and Josh and the rest of the staff at at uh, Kansas Corn for doing a phenomenal job for for Kansas corn growers. I think they do a phenomenal job for the agricultural industry as a whole in the state of Kansas because um, you know. Anything that um, uh, benefits us probably benefits the other commodity groups as also, and you know we try to float all boats. And um, so I do appreciate Greg and Josh a great deal, and and uh, I will uh, await what they have to to um, uh, say this evening, and uh, maybe I'll learn something. And uh, we've we've got some meetings coming up here uh, later in August for our summer. Uh, Kansas Corn Commission and Kansas Corn Growers meetings, and so I'll see them then. But uh, appreciate the opportunity again. Appreciate the opportunity to to uh, be involved tonight, and we'll see where it goes from there. Thank you very very much. Well, thank you, Kent, and we certainly appreciate the uh, um, support and uh, of you and the other board members and commissioners um, in giving us the the tools to do what uh, I think we've been able to do and and your leadership and, and thought with all the other commissioners have been key in some of those programs you just talked about. You know, one thing I guess I'd highlight, you know, in Kent's example of ethanol and good legislation and bad legislation and 
it just highlights one more um, reason that we need to communicate um, about our, our product, the uses, the great uses of our product, um, and whether it's in uh, our protein sources or, or in feeding livestock or whether it's in ethanol. So we are uh, really excited that we're going to, that we're joined tonight by one of our stellar colleagues um, from National Corn Growers, Neil Kasky is the Vice President of Communications um, for National Corn. He's based in St. Louis, but I happen to know he's uh, in D.C., I think, tonight, slogging away at, at uh, some really good programs that we've uh, heard about at our national meetings last week. So um, very much uh, look forward to uh, your thoughts, Neil, and what you're going to be able to share. And thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, being with us. And I think uh, we're going to let you uh, visit a little bit about um, what we've been sharing with the public who a lot of times don't know much about production agriculture. So Neil, take it away. Right on. Hey, thanks, Greg. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, this is really cool. So as, as Greg mentioned, I, so I work in, our, we have an office, at our headquarters in Chesterfield, Missouri, which is a suburb of St. Louis, office out in DC. I'm out in DC today. I know that Josh is on the other coast uh, out in San Diego. And so, I mean, I don't know if, if anything embodies the, the Zoom 2020, 2021 world more than, than the KDA uh, conference tonight. So I don't know if that gets you an award or not. Um, but uh, it is an interesting uh, observation. So, hey, appreciate uh, obviously our, our partnership with, with Kansas uh, and the, the world of uh, ethanol is, is always interesting. And so I think Russell talked about, would you say that we're all Zoom experts by now? I don't know about that. Um, I'm gonna test my proficiency by sharing my screen. You guys tell me if I did it all right. Um, let's see here. Uh, all right, do you see it? You see a cartoon on your screen? Am I passing? Mm -hmm. Right on. All right. So, uh, as Greg said, my name is Neil Kasky. I work for National Corn. I lead our communications activities. And uh, you guys will probably be surprised to know that I spent a lot of time talking about ethanol. I'm sure you guys are shocked by that. Yeah, we, we did have, there's a crazy piece of legislation introduced today. Uh, trying to repeal the RFS. We call it out as nonsense and, you know, we'll just keep doing more of that. Um, in the meantime, I want to talk with you guys a little bit this, uh, this evening, rather, about some of the things that, that we are doing uh, right here in D.C. to make sure that, that ethanol is, is part of the conversation when it comes to, to energy and, and climate change and, and everything else. And so uh, I found this picture recently. I, I, I thought it was, was pretty funny. Um, and, you know, what they say, that a picture's worth a thousand words. I, I don't know if that's true or not to a cartoon, um, but but I love it. You know, you got, you know, we hear, the, we have the lady, you know, that's screaming, hey, the EVs are coming. And I know if, if you're uh, in our space, it, it seems that way. You guys probably can't see it or not. I don't know if you can be like this guy back here in the upper right hand side of the corner of your screen. He's like kind of peering out the, the side of the building and, you know, you see he's like, who cares, right? Um, and uh, obviously, you know, that is, uh, is something that, that we uh, are, are keenly aware of and in the corn world, but, um, you know, perhaps it's, it's not as, uh, as acute, um, just kind of that, that rush towards EVs uh, as we lead it to believe. I, I do think, you know, when I think about, you know, who cares about EVs, who cares about climate, who cares about that kind of stuff? You know, it, it's quite clear to me, and I'm sure you guys as well, that, you know, the people, policymakers here in D.C., you know, they, they, they care, you know, they're quite passionate uh, about some of those things. I, I was thinking about from a communication standpoint, you know, what's the talk and, and what's the truth about some of these things. And you think about, you know, what is the talk? What are we hearing right now and all the headlines and everything that we see and on TV or reading the headlines, et cetera. And, it's, and it, I kind of have it summarized as, well, EVs are going to solve, you know, climate change all by themselves, right? And so what, what's interesting about this, and I don't know if you guys have ever seen this photo, you got to have a nice little Tesla uh, right here, it's being powered by by you know clean coal right here. You know, I mean, that's you know I, I have nothing against coal to be clear. I, I just think that's kind of funny as well. Well, the the truth is uh, there. I think you guys know this. They're going to need a lot of help. I mean, I, I think there it is true that EV can be a part of of the solution, uh, but they are not the panacea that it, it feels like they're kind of being positioned as such. Um, right now, um, they're, they're going to need some help. And a lot of the things that we're doing from a communication standpoint are all about positioning ethanol as a climate solution that exists right now. Um, and so I will touch on a few of those tactics 
Uh, first is, is a spot that is running digitally in the DC market uh, right now. So if, you, if your volume is down, if I'm already boring you, um, now's a good time to turn your volume back up because this is a pretty cool spot that I'm gonna play for you guys. I know it's always a, a challenge sometimes on Zoom. This is a 12 day old plant of corn. It's not battery powered. A young plant of corn to an electric vehicle. They're both vital in our fight against climate change. But less than 2% of vehicles on the road today are electric. And we're decades away from EVs being mainstream. That's where our little friend comes in and his two trillion brothers and sisters. Reducing 46% of carbon emissions compared to gasoline and producing clean burning ethanol, an alternative fuel for the 98% of non electric vehicles on the road today. Corn ethanol is the climate solution we need now because 30 years might be too late. So we're pretty excited about this spot. It, it is running on digital channels right now. Uh, pretty soon, we just got some funds at our meeting last week. Uh, we had a meeting um, in, in um, I, I always assume you guys know what I'm talking about. We said we had a meeting. Uh, big corn meeting down in New Orleans last week, got some funds. We're, this is gonna be running a, a shortened a 30 and the 60 second spot is gonna be running on some of our favorite Sunday shows in, in, in the coming weeks. So excited about the impact. Uh, that, that it will make. Here's another tool that we have uh, in the market right now. Um, this is, uh, uh, I guess, for maybe our, our more studious um, uh, members uh, of our audience. So this is a, a, a briefing. This is sponsored content that we have placed right now in Politico. For those of you that, that don't know, uh, Politico is, is obviously, you know, it's a, a outlet that is pretty popular here in, in Washington, D.C. for some of the the uh, political and, and, and policy wonks um, and this, um, you know, if the, you got a minute or a minute and a half to kind of tell a story with that, with that um, ad, you know, this kind of uh, goes a, a little deeper and, and talks more specifically uh, about how or, uh, corn ethanol, because of how we produce corn and, and the clean air benefits uh, of the product itself uh, is a great tool uh, to combat climate change. Um, from an industry standpoint, we just want to make sure that we're reinforcing um, some of the, the things that our, our friends in, in industry are, are hearing and, and seeing as it relates to, to ethanol. And they know that, um, you know, that obviously um, there are, are great things and great stories to, to tell as it relates to, to ethanol. This is a, a series, a podcast series that we sponsor with AgriPulse, uh, allowed us to really help kind of shape uh, this uh, five-part series uh, in a way that, that, you know, positively positioned ethanol um, among all the the mix of things. And I think um, that probably just uh, is a, a quick summary of some of the, the, the tactics that we're doing to drive uh, the strategy of making sure that ethanol is part of this climate and energy conversation. As we talk about infrastructure, as we talk about all these things that are happening right now in DC, we want to make sure that ethanol is part uh, of that conversation. And those are some of the things that we're doing uh, to make sure that that happens on top of obviously the the lobbying that's done maybe from some of you guys that have uh, relationships with members of congress the things that kansas corn is doing and and uh in all our various states and so i'll stop there josh I see you popping on on then uh, if there are any questions or if we need to advance i'm cool with that as well appreciate the time Thank you, Neil. If there's any questions, don't hesitate to put them in the chat there and we can address them now or, you know, Neil can address them a little bit later. But that was great information. I do have a question, Neil, real quick. You said that that spot that you showed, that video clip was airing in some of the markets now. And what uh, markets did you say again? Where the, Where is those airing? So you won't be seeing those in Kansas. Uh, we are, are targeting uh, some of the, the policymakers and, and policy influencers, the DC elite, we like to say, 
um, uh, right now on digital channels. And so, you know, if you're, you know, cord cutters or whatever you, you look on, uh, scroll through on your phone, uh, they will be um, exposed to that message. In a couple of weeks, we're going to be placing this on some of the Sunday shows. So think Meet the Press this week, et cetera, um, so that we can be sure that, that that ad, and I apologize, I think I muted it halfway between. I clearly am not um, Russell, a, a, a Zoom pro quite yet, maybe next year. Um, but we want to make sure that that is a great tool that delivers a pretty succinct and powerful message. And we want to make sure that that gets uh, in front of, of as many people as possible. So that's that's the plan. And I, I will say I'm probably going to have to cut out here for too long. So if there are any other questions um, or just direct all the tough ones to Greg, that's what I would do. Um, and he's going to direct them to Josh. So, you know. It's, it's hard to do comedy on, on Zoom. They might find your way back to you anyway. Oh, hey, great, great point, um, Greg. So, Will Neitzel is the, you know, he is the, uh, he, he is, I, I guess, my boss, uh, leads the chair that is, uh, is uh, enabling us to do a lot of great um, consumer and policy-related messaging right now. And so, um, so I don't know if he's on the, the, the this, this uh, program or not, but we all appreciate Lowell and his leadership. Well, I sure appreciate you taking some time out this evening, Neil. Pleasure meeting you and I really appreciate the presentation. Great information. Thanks guys. And again, okay. if there's any questions, put that in the chat. And like Neil said, he'll shoot it to Greg and Josh and back to yeah. Neil maybe. Yep, but we, we can get a hold of Neil anytime. So if you want to look at some more great assets that NCGA has communication around corn. So this was just a small piece that Neil presented tonight. They've got quite the portfolio. With Thanks, that, we will oh, go ahead, Neil. Let's see. So with that, we'll turn it to Josh Rowe, VP of Policy at at Kansas Corn, and he's going to kind of update us on what's happening with Kansas and some of the latest and greatest that he's got to share on the corn sector in Kansas. So, all right. So, I would assume can we for seeing the seeing the screen here, but uh, welcome everyone. Thanks for uh, joining the corn sector session. And I think looking through the list of participants, I. No, absolutely everyone on the on the Zoom screen here. So just to have a few slides I wanted to uh, uh, go through talking about kind of what we're following in the ag policy world uh, and just in general policy world as it relates to corn and corn and ethanol will focus on tonight. And uh, I'm gonna start with it's uh, pretty, you know, what probably gets a lot of attention these days, I think we hear from producers across the board, whether no matter what type of producer they are, is uh, worrying about how a lot of the legislation you're seeing through DC, it's discussed now how that could impact our, our farm and ranch operations. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about recent court rulings impacting ethanol and kind of give away the spoiler on that. It's not been a good few weeks for the ethanol industry through the court, but we have some uh, definite plans to get around that. But then you're gonna kind of end on two really positive high notes, uh, a piece of legislation I'm hoping to see introduced soon that uh, really has the potential to put, put ethanol forward as a great solution for climate and, uh, and, and that. So looking forward to that. And then just real quick, as Ken had mentioned in the introduction, we're seeing continued success in moving corn through higher blends of, uh, of ethanol. So uh, first slide, kind of on the, 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 what's going on in DC at a full level. I know we hear about bills getting introduced every day and that, that's how it works. But really, when you look at the controlling party uh, now of both the Senate and the House, there's really three pieces of legislation that uh, being focused on now. Much what's called the American Jobs Plan, what we hear about the American Families Plan, and then the budget, budget reconciliation, how that gets through there. Kind of the traditional infrastructure American Jobs Plan, uh, which is tends to be the most bipartisan of uh, the three things we'll talk about tonight. That is what we think about as traditional infrastructure, some important pieces that will come up in all sectors of this Ag Growth Summit, you know, our roads, uh, broadband, you know, internet connectivity, 
uh, you know, it gets to be waterways. We don't think about waterways as touching Kansas a lot, but that's an ever important tool for, for moving our grain commodities. It makes up a good deal of the price that we pay in that. So that's kind of the main pieces of that legislation. What's been pr proposed to pay for it is uh, increasing several things, but the main thing is increasing the corporate tax rate from 21 to 28 percent. I know a vast majority of farms are not organized as corporation, corporate entities, so they would not be adversely impacted like that. But just something to watch for this could have a major impact on our you know, input suppliers, on our value added suppliers, and of course, those farms that are organized as corporation. Probably the one that we're following the most because this seems to have the most impact for especially families, small and medium family farmers out there. It has to do with what we call the care economy, how it's there. This is a very large bill that's, you know, it's we're talking multiple trillions of dollars, lots of things. But this is when you're hearing about uh, child care, you know, assistance, community college funding and student debt relief. That's kind of under this umbrella. And uh, proposed, you know, it's always a moving target where, where things are, but some of the pay fors of this legislation, this is where, you know, we, we've been engaged on uh, increasing the upper income tax bracket and state tax changes, and then a lower threshold for capital gains taxes. And so where, where we walk, look at on that is if that would were to get, uh, if they would decrease the amount of uh, assets that one generation could transfer to another, you know, I've heard as low as $1 million, $2 million. Uh, dollars. Uh, if you lowered that down, we all know with that seems like a lot of money for people, but uh, you don't have to with today's land prices and just the asset richness of uh, a lot of agriculture, even some pretty small uh, farms would get uh, would get caught up into that potentially. So if they did what's called the elimination of stepped up basis and you had a reduction in that estate tax exemption, you could get to a point where, uh, you know, just passing your farm down from one generation to the next, you could have a good deal of assets subject to a 45% capital gains rate. And well, ag farms especially tend to be asset rich, cash, cash poor. So, you know, it could be in a situation where heirs to a farm would have to sell a good piece of the farm just to pay the taxes, which is, you know, obviously not an ideal situation whatsoever. We've done a lot of outreach on this with our congressional delegation. In fact, we uh, co-signed a letter that we sent out to uh, uh, Sharice Davids and uh, and the, on the Kansas City, Kansas side, and then uh, Congressman Emmanuel Cleaver is on the Missouri side. We did a, a joint branded outreach uh, with them with Missouri Corn, just talking about how this could impact uh, small farms in the, in their district. Uh, it's been neat. Uh, the National Corn Board had a chance to meet with the Senate Ag Committee uh, chairman via Zoom a few weeks ago, and they really walked through this process with him. And it was amazing. It was literally within the next couple of days after that, he sent a letter to President Biden uh, saying how, you know, we need to make sure farms are protected under this. But something that we keep an eye on that we hear, we're hearing a lot about from around the country. And then just the final thing is just kind of budget reconciliation. And that's a process that could happen uh, that the Democrats could, you know, push a budget bill through without any uh, bipartisan uh, support whatsoever. But uh, to watch on that, you know, there's less of an uh, impact on on actual tax policy changes because there's no policy riders around. It's just a budget. So those are the overall pieces at the kind of the tax impact our farm level. Uh, just shifting gears now, uh, kind of if I step back to 2019, it was really a pretty good year. Uh, for ethanol in the regulatory and in the um, uh, judicial uh, uh, arenas, both. Uh, we, uh, National Corn, among some ethanol groups, uh, joined in and they challenged how uh, the EPA was issuing what's called small refinery exemptions, SR or SREs. That is what a refiner can apply, or oil refiner uh, can apply for uh, to kind of uh, prevent them from complying with the RFS, or in other words, to keep them from blending more ethanol, they can apply and receive an SRE. Uh, through like the Obama administration, SREs were very lightly used, but under the Trump administration, we saw a record number of SREs issued. And uh, 
uh, EPA was using this um, this method to say, hey, well, if you qualified for an SRE in the past, you automatically qualified for one this year. Uh, you know, it, it, it wasn't that easy. It wasn't automatic, but it made the process a lot easier and more sure. The National Corn, along with some ethanol groups, challenged how that was done, along with some other things that goes into that process. And, uh, you know, one at the at the first level and at the appeals court uh, process uh, that was appealed, uh, the uh, oil industry uh, appealed that to the Supreme Court. And quite surprisingly, uh, late June, the Supreme Court did overturn a major piece of that case that stated that uh, that your hardships weren't combined from, from year to year. Uh, but I must say the other pillars, uh, such as uh, what categories you could use to prove a hardship, uh, are are uh, can can be included. Those those remain. So it was uh, although the major piece of the court uh, that battle was lost with the with connectivity of SREs. Some other pieces remain. So that was that was that was a good stinger uh, for for several pieces of the ethanol industry. And then, but uh, probably a lot bigger impact that came down uh, July second. That I think was a pretty big shock. Uh, to the industry as well as in 2019, the uh, EPA under Trump uh, cleared the way to allow for the sale of E15 year round. Uh, you know, E15 was just restricted on some technical basis uh, during the summer driving season, which is June 1 to September 15th. Uh, the administration paved the way to allow for the year round sale of E15. And that's where you probably heard us and uh, talk about in our work with KDA, KDAT as well. We also had to do some extra work to allow for year-round sale of E15 in the Kansas City area. Got that all pushed through. And uh, this court ruling this time vacated that rule. So we're back to the pre-2019 uh, era. And this whole argument was just made on just the regu on the methods they use to, uh, to, to push this through. It has nothing to do with the fuel. You know, no one's arguing. The fact that E15 is a, a lower carbon, a cheaper, cheaper fuel. It's just in a technicality. You've got to love uh, regula regulatory agencies and lawyers and all that. And it does only um, impact the summer driving season. And just with the timing of the announcement and everything, it should not impact E15 sales this summer. So retailers that are offering E15 can offer it. And then once you get outside of September, that is beyond the scope of this rule. And so the big piece is to have this fixed either regulatorily or through new law before June 1 of, uh, of next year. Legislation was introduced last week uh, to remedy this. I was happy to see uh, both of our senators, Moran and Roberts, our, excuse me, Moran and Marshall were original co-sponsors of the legislation as well as uh, Congressman Estes. And I hope we can get the other uh, members of Congress to join this as well. Uh, so that's kind of two pieces through there. Uh, but a lot of you that know me, I like to talk about positive things and really what is that next great thing moving forward. And that would be a piece of legislation we're hoping to see introduced very soon called the Next Generation Fuels Act. And it's a it's a pretty in-depth piece of legislation, but I have the major points and how they could really impact the ethanol industry, the, the climate uh, side of things, and really help the autom automakers to continue to uh, produce internal combustion engines. And what this does is uh, starting in uh, year 2026, uh, all automakers would be required to design, if they're making an internal combustion vehicle, to design car and lights truck to run on a minimum what's called a 95 RON fuel. And so uh, the, the way octane's measured varies. And so this would be like uh, the number you see at the pump, those stickers that say 87, 89, 91. That's actually a different measurement of octane. I'm not going to get into that. So this would be about how you're used to seeing those stickers on a pump. This would make a sticker that said 93. So all new vehicles starting in 2026 would have to run on a 95 RON fuel. Uh, what's great about this, why the ethanol industry is really supportive, it would probably equal out to make our base fuel rate for all new vehicles at an E17 and a half, E20 in there. And what's great is a vast majority of our uh, existing fuel infrastructure can uh, is compatible with 95 runs, so we don't need a big reinvention of the wheel on either side. Uh, 
talked a lot with the automakers on this and are receiving some really some really warm welcome from the autos from this too, even though it appears to kind of uh uh, you know, put some restrictions on them. It also gives them some good credits to uh, to qualify for others. And then starting in 2031, we raise the bar a bit, and that's when the minimum fuel standard would go to a 98 run. And uh, we think that that could really shake out to being a base fuel rate of E25 to E30. Uh, some older fuel stations would need upgrades, but uh, uh, through that, among with Along with this is uh, some some funding to help for that. So, but that gives us some time to step up because the automakers are only going to be supportive, obviously, of making cars to run on a special fuel unless they know from day one a consumer can go buy that fuel. Uh, some other great uh, pieces of this legislation is order to qualify as a 95 RON or a 98 RON fuel. Uh, you must uh, the fuel has to reduce greenhouse gases at least by four, a minimum of 40 percent. And then we'll see if that'll be interesting, if that's kind of a moving target, maybe that number might increase uh, through throughout this process. But, uh, and then all new vehicles are warranted to take up to E30. You'll see on my next couple slides why that's real important. We're seeing a big surge in E30 sales in Kansas through our grant uh, stations there. Uh, all new fueling infrastructure from, from the date of this bill's passage on would be compatible with E40 or higher. So that way we're knowing as stations are upgrading, they'll be compatible with these future fuels. And then it just kind of fixes a lot of other issues where ethanol gets a bad shake in the regulatory world. We really are, we're, we're arguably sometimes even at this at the state level, but also at the federal level now where there's just been so much open interpretation of the law and it's just created these hot button political footballs that has passed between the ethanol and the oil industry uh, that uh, it's uh, just, seems to be more beneficial all involved if we just put these rules in legislation so it's a law of the land and we're not open to this regulatory uh, uncertainty. And again, we're expecting introductions shortly and hoping to uh, have great support from our from our Kansas delegation. Uh, just last couple slides and I'll end it here uh, again. Uh, Kansas corn since 2016, which was an original partnership with KDA, and uh, they've, you know, we've taken over since since then. Uh, has provided some work with a lot of great fueling stations across the state to put in uh, higher ethanol blends. Our traditional program, we pay up to twenty-five thousand dollars per dispenser if you're going to offer the higher blends of ethanol are up to 75,000 per station and then we just came out with a new grant for E15 only uh, through that and that is uh, most stations are already compatible you can run E15 through so there's very minimal upgrade costs associated so this is a lot smaller dollar amount of $2,500 per dispenser if you're just offering E15 and not any other higher blends of, of ethanol. And then we'll also help with some marketing and signage to uh, to go through there. And I'm hoping uh, you'll, you'll continue to see some increased uh, E15 adoption. We got some great, great partners uh, 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 through that. Uh, be sure to look at uh, the probably the latest two uh, besides our our, the jumpstart stations in the Wichita area have been really just great partners there. But uh, the, the other one you'll see if you're by the 24-7 the uh, brand of uh, stations, uh, you'll see in their McPherson locations already offering a E15. And then I believe the, their location in Salina is as well and more to come from there. So that's where we're at. And at the end of the day, you can see here, this just goes through 2020. This is incremental gallons of ethanol sold. So these are gallons sold of ethanol over and above E10 blends. And you can see just seeing good steady growth, even through 2020, which if you would have seen this graph of fuel demand in 2020, you know, it's down significantly. We didn't have those large uh, decreases in ethanol demand, at least in Kansas, uh, like, like was experienced with the overall motor gasoline. And then here's what's a really interesting story. So two pie charts here, I'll run through them real quick. In 2016, 2017, the stations that were participating, uh, even though they were offering these higher blends of ethanol, consumers were still purchasing about 60% they were selling 60% E10 and 40% these higher blends. We look at 2020 where our numbers averaged out 
we, over, we more than flipped that ratio around. So you see less than 40% of all sales at these stations was E10, and then 60% was higher blends of ethanol, especially you see the growth in E30 at 34.96, uh, so just under 35%. It is a, it's a great fuel. I strongly recommend it if you're especially in the Wichita area, uh, stop by a Jumpstart location. They offer E30, or they call it super premium at all their locations. It is a, it is a great high-performing fuel to try. So those are kind of the overall pieces there. And thanks again, Russ, for helping put this together and get things through. I can always take questions now or anytime in the future. I think everyone knows how to get a hold of me. Appreciate the information, Josh. And like you said, if you have questions, now would be a great time. Uh, throw them in the chat there. I do have kind of a question to kick the maybe a little conversation starter. So, Josh, before we got going with the, the live version of this sector, we you were talking a little bit about California and the E85 demand out there. Could you talk a little bit about that? And maybe what, what are you seeing or what are you hearing as the biggest, I guess, barrier to yeah. seeing that kind of shift happen around the other states? Yeah, so that's a good thing. So as kind of Neil mentioned and talked before, I happen to be out in uh, San Diego uh, right now on that, that California just remains, even though you know, all you're hearing about EV, EVs, they remain a very good customer of ethanol. You know, California has about 10% of the nation's fuel demand and uh, that, and we you know we've you might have heard we're currently going through a whole other set of processes to get E15 approved out here in California, which we hope to have done by wheels move pretty slow out here. Hopefully by January 23, E15 will be approved in California. And I've got good expectations that E15 will quickly become one of the base fuels there. And why I have confidence in that is the way their low carbon fuel standard work, it provides additional benefits to low carbon fuels. Uh, so E85 being one, if you look at over the past like eight years, E85 has been on average about $1.30 a gallon cheaper than E10 fuel out here in California. But over the last year, uh, it's actually been uh, $2 a gallon cheaper. It's running closer to $2 a gallon cheaper. So even you might get a 15 to 20% decrease in fuel economy when you switch to E85 over E10, you're saving $2 a gallon. It's a really economical fuel. It's been at some groups of stations very successful at offering E85. And we're seeing uh, uh, over the last eight years, we've averaged 30% year over year growth in E85 sales. So uh, uh, looking to continue to, uh, to increase that and get, get more vehicles on the road and, and that. And so that's another big thing uh, there that's also in that Next Generation Fuels Act uh, there is it continues to make sure automakers have great incentives to make the FFBs uh, uh, as well. So, because we need we need more flex fuel vehicle options out there. Unfortunately, the credits that they once enjoyed are not there anymore. And so there's that. So Ms. Latsky, um, okay, that is some good stuff. So that is good. Anything else I'll ask, I'm gonna answer uh, Jennifer's question here. Is there anything else on the ethanol? front there, Russ, or I'll pivot to some infrastructure. I think you're good going ahead with Jennifer's question there about the infrastructure. Yeah, that'll be good. And Greg's got a lot of experience in this and well, so he can he can definitely uh, back me up. But uh, that is our existing infrastructure, meet the future potential export sales of grain and ethanol out of the state. Uh, so that that's a, that's a great question. You know, um, when we're shipping grain out of the state or international, it tends to run, you know, direct line into, into Mexico. You know, we have shuttle loading facilities in Kansas that can get our grain on class one rails. And I think within 40 hours, we can have corn or uh, distiller's grain into Mexico. We're hoping uh, to, as Mexico, to continue work with Mexico on the ethanol front. So that could also potentially be a good market for our ethanol plants to export down to Mexico. So I'd say we're in about the best position you can get on that rail side for into Mexico. To the coast is another is another piece, you know, some ethanol uh, plants in the state have had great luck of, uh, you know, shipping ethanol out here to California and getting premium prices. 
but really to get us to the coast that, you know, there's limited opportunities, get us to the Pacific Northwest and, and some, some other regions there that have traditionally been backfilled by others. And then on the roadside, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's just a continual uh, a piece that, uh, that it's always going to be that, that struggle. I've always said, you know, from my own farm experience, uh, if I put on my farmer hat as all well, as like, well, our, our own operation, the equipment's got massive to take care of uh, all these efficiencies. But at the end of the day, you know, our semis can haul the same amount of corn today as they could uh, 25 years ago, right? So it's the same amount. We got a little more weight in with, on a third axle with a permit. Uh, that That's fine uh, to go through there, but there still is those uh, those kind of uh, limitations in, in the system there. And so, yeah, increased need for especially rural, rural bridges, rural highways and that really showing that um, how the movement of our commodities out of the state or into further processing there, how it benefits the entire state, supports a lot of jobs. So even, you know, that's why, you know, people in, uh, and urban legislators in Wichita, Kansas City should care more about more four lane highway access, passing lanes and all that out in Garden City, because they're moving a lot of product to get further process other places. So, Greg, what 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 did I miss in, in that as far as some holes in our infrastructure? Well, I think I'll just add as far as the infrastructure, especially receiving ethanol in Mexico um, is where there was some development going on um, pre the current Mexican administration of AMLO, but then AMLO has kind of moved it back towards uh, or stopping the privatization that was happening in the energy industry and moving it almost back to more of a nationalization, along with a court case um, that has kept in the three major Metro area, the largest metro areas in Mexico, keeping the ethanol blend at 5.8% rather than the 10%. So sometimes that infrastructure is also important on the receiving end, ethanol in this case, in some cases it's been how to receive distillers grains in train um, shipments as well. And we worked with, in our counterparts in Missouri, have worked with Grains Council to uh, uh, have equipment there to help with unloading distillers, which has a tend to do a little bit more bridging um, as it rolls down the railroad track um, to get there. So and focus on Mexico. And I would say um, that uh, highlights uh, that we're watching closely um, the progression of the sale of the Kansas City Southern um, Railroad, because that has got one of the most direct lines into Mexico. So with our uh, friends at National Corn, at the national level with the um, Service Transportation Board, really watching that unfold, because it's gonna be important. It's key to move whichever type of product um, we want to move. Um, there's some intricacies about ethanol usage in Mexico, which includes the fact that, um, at least uh, in Guadalajara, a lot of it is trucked over the border, already blended, can be already blended, at hopefully at the E10, but um, it may be at the E5.8. And then um, working with uh, power sources or, or those in power in Mexico to help them understand they're importing their MTBE from the Texas Gulf Coast refineries. And we would much rather um, make that ethanol blends that are coming in. And we also think it, of course, would be uh, significantly environmentally more friendly um, for the Mexican environment as well. So that's what I'd highlight. Awesome. Thank you guys. Uh, other questions from the group? Anyone else got a question they want to throw out there? Please you feel free to unmute, unmute yourself or throw it back in the chat there. And while you may be thinking about that, we do have a poll question. So I asked Sean to throw the poll question up. And this has to do with the current outcomes and objectives that are in the corn sector that has come out of previous growth summits. So. At this poll, there should be four choices on there. So please select one, select the one outcome that you feel should be the highest priority for right now in the corn sector. So go ahead and take that poll. There's four choices there, effective adoption of conservation practices and management. Number two is 50% of fuel stations with readily available E15. 
Number three is the distiller's dried grain with solubles is widely used feed ration. And then the last one, increased the amount of corn processed with value added in Kansas. So adding that value to it before it leaves the state. Like we have about half of them done. Okay. I think we've got about everybody on there. We'll go ahead and end the poll. And does everybody see the results? Are they up there now, Sean? Yeah. It's like we kind of had a tie there. 50% of the fuel stations with the readily available E15 and that last one there, increasing the amount of corn, adding that value to it before it leaves the state. And I know we just had well, we have maybe 12 people left on the call. I appreciate you guys staying on there and taking part of that poll. Any, any thoughts about that poll? Anything that sticks out? Maybe even Kent or Greg or Josh, anything surprises you there? Or is that kind of what, what you were thinking? I'll take that one, I guess. I mean, I, I mean, I think that that's, you know, from a, from a grower's perspective, I guess, um, you know, I, you know, I guess I see the greatest opportunity in, is through increased ethanol use. And, you know, I don't think that there's any doubt, you know, a lot of times we get, um, you know, commodity prices rise, we get in the, we get in the food versus fuel debate and all of that stuff. And that really, all of that is just, is just noise. I mean, I think um, obviously uh, Kansas producers and, and U.S. corn producers can, can serve the needs of of energy and and livestock feed and 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 food for our nation and and uh, we can get it done basically year in and year out. Yeah, there's going to be some year down the road that uh, that things don't go right, but by and large, most of the time uh, we're going to produce that bushel and and have and have plenty. And um, uh, so, I mean, I think anything from a producer standpoint, anything that increases um the scope and reach of ethanol is good um i mean and you know a lot of times um uh, you know that that industry that ethanol industry is has intertwined itself and is so um uh compatible with our livestock industry in the state and it's just been a win-win for uh, agriculture and the state in general um, to have that uh, to have that going on in our state and and in the United States. So that's kind of how I see it, and um, um, appreciate it. Appreciate the comments. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. What I you know, assuming we get past these regulatory hurdles, especially on the E15 front, which I have confidence we will there. I really think, I don't know where it is, but Greg and I and my colleagues, other, we always talk about, we're gonna receive, we're gonna get to this natural tipping point with E15 where, uh, and we, and I've heard chatter from, you know, some fuel retail stations already that are offering E15, maybe because the competitors started offering it and it'll, it'll go from being kind of this, uh, let's try something new or there's some money available. Let's go with this too. Oh, we've got to adopt it kind of, especially uh, it sells a lot better when fuel prices are, are high now as well. And as vehicles continue to get newer and you just don't have that drop off in your miles per gallon. So it's a more economical, cleaner fuel. So really hope it, hope it gets to that. And on the value added piece, always uh, love uh, working through that, whether it's through ethanol or uh, any of our other uh, uh, livestock or protein sectors. I'm going to say it's it's all value added once it kind of leaves the farm in a way whether it's ethanol like you said or it's headed in the feed we're adding some value to it but more avenues more opportunities so any other questions comments okay I want to be respectful of everybody's time so um I, I just want to thank everybody I appreciate your time tonight can't really appreciate you taking time out of the field I understand you had a little irrigation issue and hopefully you got that taken care of or you're probably headed to that right now after this but appreciate everybody taking time um 
I do want to remind you that this is all recorded and it'll be on the website, the agriculture.ks.gov slash summit, and that'll be up on the recording next week. We hope you're planning to join us here in, in person on August 26th. So the Ag Growth Summit will be in person on August 26th at the Manhattan Conference Center. So please go to the website there and get registered for that. Again, there will also be that social the evening before. So we hope to see you here then. Also, before we go, I want to make sure to recognize that we're doing our Ag Heroes, the Kansas Ag Heroes nomination again this year. So we encourage you to submit nominations for any individual, family, or business in Kansas agriculture that you feel has provided a notable contribution to the agriculture industry or their respective communities as a whole over this past year. So please go to that site, and that's also on the agriculture.ks.gov slash ag heroes, and please submit a nomination. So that nomination period is currently open, and that'll close on August 13th. So with that, again, a big thank you to Kansas Corn and, and everybody else that chose to be on here this evening. Again, it'll be recorded for later. So thank you all very much, and have a great evening.